Okay, these people are awful, awful, awful. And uh, <clears throat> anyhow, there is no overpopulation. The earth could probably support a hundred times. I don't know how many more people. But don't believe that. The true reality is, is that people can live together and they love these big dense cities and they can have that. They can have beautiful crystalline giant cities, alabaster skyscrapers and all that stuff. You know, and, and, and live in peace, peace and safety and joy and security and contentment with their neighbors. Okay, we can have a billion people to a city, have cities everywhere. We could have open farmland, you know, uh, farms can grow all the food. I mean, we can satisfy the world's food supply just with what we can grow in California. There's no shortage of water. We can create fresh water artificially through de desalinization units. This is a fact. Do something with the salt. I mean, you know, some people say, oh, well, it makes the ocean salty. Well, then get rid of it. Transport it somewhere else where it's not going to hurt anything. The point I'm trying to make is that, you know, this is a lie from the pit of hell. The idea of the earth is overpopulated. We could create vastly more fish in the ocean by creating artificial uh, reefs out there that's going to encourage fish in a very natural way that's unobtrusive. And, uh, you know, it, it's aesthetically pleasing. It's under the ocean. I mean, there's answers to all of our problems. And we're far from running out of enough land, you know, so we don't even, the idea of talking about making artificial land and islands, which we can do, that's a long way down the line. So I think I've addressed the overpopulation issue now. So it's really a non-issue that keeps fe being fed down our throats. Have as many kids as you want. You're doing what is written in scripture. You're obeying the commandments. You're going forth to be fruitful and multiply. And when the earth is satisfied to God's satisfaction, it is populated to God's satisfaction, then he simply pulls a fertility gene and that's it. No more populating because, you know, we're living forever and we don't need to populate. You understand how this works? Okay, there's no shortage of real estate. It just in this one galaxy alone, there's countless populated, could be populated plants. Over 500 million is estimated by science that are, are habitable. So, you know, the wealth of the galaxy is great. The wealth of this earth is great. And this wealth, who, what man could say shouldn't be shared by all? How can anybody say, yes, I want prosperity for my children, my family, but it's okay that we have this imbalance and you don't aren't allowed to have that prosperity. You see, this is what's making it so you can't enjoy your prosperity. So, you know, this is, this is the mindset we have to understand what's going on. We are double-minded. And when your conscience says, you know what, I can't even enjoy, I want to enjoy my nice threads. I want to enjoy my nice watches. I want to enjoy my nice automobile and my nice houses and my nice stuff, okay? Something, my conscience is bugging me because I know intuitively, instinctively, because I have that God gene and I can't get around it. As much as I want to divorce myself from it, separate myself from the spirit of truth, it's confounding me and I can't. You see, this is the fail-safe that God put in the heart and mind and spirit of man. So it's pulling us to a solution and the solution is universal prosperity. This is it. When I talk about equality, it has nothing to do with, you know, I'm never going to be as good at anything as this guy or that guy or this guy. I mean, I'm going to be really good at some things, but there's always going to be people that are better. There's always going to be people that aren't as good. So when he talks about it's a very arbitrary idea of equality, but it's written in our Constitution. This understanding, all men are created equal. That's equal rights. That's equal entitlements. But that shouldn't be, you know, a, a selective exclusive privilege that we see. This is this elitist mentality. And if you say, you know, some equality is inevitable, is it, all this and that, if you want to start rationalizing and reasoning about, you know, so you're going to be the decider. So now you're the one that decides, well, what imbalance is okay? You say, well, you know what, we've got imbalance, but, but it's okay because it's not me, because I'm okay, I'm well healed, financially speaking, I'm prosperous, my family is going to be okay. So it's not my issue, it's somebody else's issue. You see, 
then you are divorcing yourself from your moral obligation to your fellow man. It's not a religious obligation, it's an ethical and it's a moral obligation you have to follow in the spirit of truth and to abide by your conscience and to console your conscience with the acceptance of this spirit of truth which says I must care about others that means love it that means wanting the same thing for others that you want for yourself this is the golden rule this whole idea Jesus telling his disciples to love others the way he has loved them okay indiscriminately and we've got to correct each other we can do it whatever way God puts on our hearts you don't need to excoriate people in a negative way you could do it in your own tactful manner do it in the way that suits you best, the way that you want to do it. I myself wish that I was the nicest guy in the world. You know, like you take your dog to the dog park and your dog is the friendliest dog there. You know, that's the guy I'd like to be, okay? But it's hard to do that when you're so busy correct, trying to correct people's thinking, when you see so clearly where their thinking is askew, where they're thinking selfishly. Besides, it's about saving. This is common. This is well, where do you draw the line? When do you stop saving and when are you just hoarding great wealth? Okay, when it's going to speak against you once you're in your grave, like Jesus telling the story of the man that heaped up all this great wealth for himself, but he was poor toward God. He hadn't abided by his conscience. He hadn't invested in real valuables, real treasures, which is being sharing the mind of God and allowing it to come in and enrich you and be the person that God wants you to be. Please Him so the rewards you get are everlasting, eternal rewards, real rewards, invisible rewards that you get to keep forever. Rewards of the heart and your mind and your spirit and your soul and an understanding that you know these good things God gave you, these invisible qualities, which is your true essence, your character, your, you know, your substance. You get to keep it forever. He doesn't take away good things. That real things are often invisible. We've got to wrap our minds around that. Look at the air you breathe as an example, a scientific example, that you will live forever. You are God's child. He gave you life and he doesn't take it away. He doesn't take that away from even the wicked people. So knowing that you get to keep this, having that ounce of faith, that itty bitty smidgen of faith, you know, with that, you can move mountains like Jesus taught these things you know and we've got to just you know help other people to see the truth to cut through the lies the disinformation the, the misinformation and cut to the chase and say I want to see clearly then you've got to see what is the root of all evil so what is the cause of all evil all our problems all through the ages what is the root problem how do we fix it we've got to get to the bottom of it it's all through the money. It's all, you know, stay focused, understand it, until the, we the people gain control of the power of the issuance of our currency. Things will not change. They will continue to descend. When we the people can choose our own destiny, then that means we will have the ability to issue our own currency. And it doesn't matter whose name is on it, except we the people's name is on it. And we understand that We've got to have rules that apply to all. And the only time your currency should ever dip in worth is when there is a disruption in the supply chain. Going back to the supply and demand principles and the logic and reason of why your currency should go up in value and not down. If there's a drought in the land and there's a shortage of a commodity, then this is the only explanation of why your currency should go down in value, worth less, be, become debased because a, a commodity you needed and the services related to it went up, became more dear, inflated in cost. That's the only time for a brief period until you solve it. And then collectively, as a society, a supposedly civilized society, we focus on that issue until we solve it, and we will solve it in short order because we don't want to stop the train to universal prosperity because we see our own prosperity. Our ability to enjoy our own prosperity is inextricably entwined in this 
universal prosperity, universal equality, universal freedom, universal security, universal contentment, and we are we stay focused on that. So understand that the things that I know that are worth something, anything, came from above, okay? We are all creatures of the divine. God gave us a brain. So anytime we have a good idea, a good thought, give glory to God. So for the same reasons I've explained about this inculcation, this indoctrination into the belief systems of these, the ones running our lives that create the policies we all have to live under, We've got multitudes of people around the world that are subconsciously and inadvertently opposed to social economic justice because they believe, they've been trained to believe, somehow you're going to lose out in this equation because if the problem goes away, you're rendered irrelevant. So we've got to get past that. You've got to help people to understand, no, it's not about taking from anybody. It's about allowing others to have.